Good evening. We're ready for chapter 7 in the uh, revelation of Jesus Christ. Thank you for being here for our Bible study tonight. After these things, after the four horsemen we saw last week, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth or the, on the sea or on any tree. Thank you, Lord, for the blessings of today that we are covered by your blood, protected by your hand, attended to by your angels. We have the hope of glory, the hope of heaven, the hope of being like Christ. So we are rich and we are well loved. Help us to focus on your goodness and the blessed state we have in you. With that in mind, we look outwards to a lost world. And we pray your blessings upon us that we might become a blessing. Use us for your glory. Strengthen us for your tasks. Give us wisdom that we might see into the hearts of others and love them as Jesus loves them. Help us to minister, we beg. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We began Revelation talking about John, his state, we described Jesus in his, all his glory. We talked to the seven churches and, re, and received seven different pictures of how a church can be. We had the picture of the throne of God in all his glory, and we saw God as the creator of the universe and therefore the owner, the master. Then we saw the lamb, God the redeemer, and we saw the picture of God's love, the great, one of the most wonderful secrets in the universe is the great God of the universe loves us. Makes no sense, we did not earn it, but he does. Then we began to look at history, the unveiling of history, actually the breaking of the seals that were obscuring the scroll which is the purpose of God for the world his plan we saw the four horsemen first come bringing the results of conquest and warfare and pestilence and death we saw that God is focused on his children in the midst of all this. These are the things that are meant by after these things. Now we see four looking again to the right to see them coming across the stage. We see four angels standing at the four corners of the earth. Now that indicates worldwide. Four is worldwide. These winds are the winds of well, some scholars will say it's, they're the winds of evil, but they're the winds of judgment. Sometimes God's judgment, when it is retribution, seems to be evil. But it's not. It's harsh. But it's not evil. Judgment is being held back by these angels. Verse 2, Then I saw another angel descending from the east where the sun comes where the light shines into the darkness having the seal of the living God Paul tells us that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit and that seal means that we as I explained earlier in the Bible study a seal is the proof of authenticity it's the proof that the document has not been tampered with whether it was clay poured over a document so that 
you could prove that it had not been cracked open until you cracked it open to read it, or whether it was just wax poured over with a signet ring pressed into it for the same purpose. The seal means that no one has broken into the message to tamper with it. We are guaranteed by God's Holy Spirit to be safe from the tampering of the devil. Now, he can lie to us. He is the father of lies. But that is the only power Satan has over the Christian. He lies. Now, he lies magnificently. And many times we'll believe his lies and believe he has power over us. He does not. He has the power to lie to us and nothing else. Now, he has power over the lost, but not over God's children. The seal, then, is important. And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea. That's where some people take this to mean evil. But again, this is retribution. This is judgment day. Saying, do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees. Now that word harm also means let not a ripple occur. The earth's not going to move a touch. The seas are not going to ripple. The trees are not going to even jiggle. Until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. Now this is an obvious reference back to Ezekiel chapter 9 verse 4. And the Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it. This seal is the proof of authenticity. The, the mark of the Antichrist will be real. It will mark the people who are owned by the Antichrist. I'll admit I've always been uh, disturbed by the fact that once you receive that seal, you can't be redeemed. There are scholars who have... Um, theories about that, and we might talk about those later. But there's once the seal is applied, it's irrevocable. When God's people are sealed, they'll never be touched. They're not they're untouchable. And then he names the tribes. Of the tribe of Judah, twelve thousand were sealed. Of the tribe of Reuben, twelve thousand were sealed. Of the tribe of Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, Zebulon, Joseph, and Benjamin, 12,000 were sealed in each. He doesn't mention um, Dan. He doesn't mention, um, forgive me. He doesn't mention um, Ephraim. We're told that they gave themselves over to idolatry, worshiping idols. And so they're out. Theories. There are people who theorize that these are literally 12,000 Jews. I have problems with that, and I'm going to tell you why in a moment. There are those who say that these are 12,000 from each tribe, 144,000, who will emerge at the end of time, and certainly there will be another 144,000 mentioned later. But these are sealed. Their, sal their salvation is guaranteed. If you believe this to be a literal 144,000 Jews, then you're going to have to ask yourself, why just 144,000? You're also going to have to ask something else. Where are the Gentile Christians? Why would God seal the foreheads of 144,000 Jewish Christians, but not seal Gentile Christians? 
After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues. Now certainly this is Gentiles. Standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, remember victory, and palm branches in their hands. Now, yes, palm branches meant victory in the Roman world. A general uh, would, would have palm branches when he won a war or a battle. In the Greek world, palm branches were given to the athlete who won. But you need to remember, in a Jewish world, in John's world, the, the Feast of um, Tabernacles was a time of celebration, a time of joy over God saving his people out of Egypt. This is what palm branches means here. They're celebrating their redemption. They're wearing white robes for victory and palm branches for the joy of their redemption, the joy of their salvation. Crying out, this large group that you cannot number is crying out, verse 10, with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders said, saying to me, one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes and where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They don't need a seal because they've been killed already. These are dead saints in heaven. And it's a wonderful picture of John to show. Earlier, it, it, he talked about the churches that were going to face persecution and that he warned that all Christians are going to be in danger of persecution. And here they are with white robes of victory and palm fronds of joy at their salvation, standing before God praising his name. There's your wife. There's your child who was killed. There's your father who was killed. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in the temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. This is a picture of, of salvation for the martyrs. Now, there are those who say this is just for the martyrs, uh, and the Catholic Church names them as saints. The way to sainthood is to die a martyr. But there are many who have died through persecution. Some people want to just say these are those at the end of time who die. This is it's a number no one can number. It's so big, you can't put a number to it. It was more people than you shake a stick at. These are two pictures of the same people except the ones on earth and the second, the ones in heaven already dead. These are all of those who've died for the faith. The, the 12 then are, the 12,000 from each tribe are 12 times 12 times 10 times 10 times 10. 12 is worldwide religion times worldwide religion times complete, times complete, times complete. It's all the Christians on earth. Remember, Paul told us in Galatians that Gentile Christians are the new spiritual children of Abraham. More than that, they are the true spiritual children of Abraham. The Jews said, we're the children of Abraham. And Paul's rejoinder was, not anymore, you left 
you're the you're the children of the flesh like Ishmael but you're not the children of the spirit not the children of the promise we are because we're true to God through Jesus Christ this is all Christians on the ones on earth then are sealed for protection now this doesn't mean they don't get persecuted else you would not have the second group that are that are recently martyred and now in heaven but it means we can't be touched the devil can't have us all he can do is kill us and send us to heaven he can't have us that's important to know the Romans could do anything they wanted to but you're still going to be with Jesus. The government today can do anything they want, no matter what country you're a citizen of, no matter what level of persecution you face. The government can only kill you. They can't take you away from God. There's a promise here. They shall neither hunger in, anymore nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. For the lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of water and God will wipe away every tear from their eye. There are many people who take this to mean that we don't cry in heaven. And I've seen some really outlandish theories because if you're going to say there are no, there are no tears in heaven, then you have to say there's nothing that makes you sad in heaven. I've had friends tell me that that's proof that you won't remember your anything about earth because there are people on earth you loved who are now lost, who died lost, and you would grieve over them. You'd grieve over a child who refused to accept Christ. You'd grieve over a parent in the same state. I don't think this says there will never be any more tears and never any more sadness. I'm not quite sure how you can have joy without having the opposite. You have to contrast it with something. I think that when we cry, God wipes our tears. And that's a more beautiful promise to me. That every time I cry, God is there to wipe the tears from my eyes. It's a picture of enduring love, not a one-time change of my heart so that I'll never grieve again. I'm not even sure if I want that. I think I want my memories, even the sad ones. I would hope that as I continue to grow in heaven that I would see them in a new way see them through the eyes of God and understand better. But we know that God grieves off over the lost. He grieves over those who die without hope. Breaks God's heart for those who suffer in hell. That's part of what makes him who he is. Jesus cried out, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who stones the prophets and kills those whom God sent to you. How often I wanted to take you under my wings as a hen does her chicks, but you would not. Jesus grieving over a Jerusalem that had rejected him in the past and was going to continue to reject him. I think that's part of life. Theories. I mentioned earlier some people believe that these 12,000 only appear at the end of time. I believe it's a separate. These 144,000. I believe that's a separate number. Some people say these are the ones who emerge after Christians are raptured. If you're a futurist, if you believe only that the uh, book of Revelation is about the future, and again, I don't. I think the book of Revelation has been specifically written for each individual, for each age, for each period of time. But there are those who say that once Christians are raptured from the earth, then the remaining Jews, 144,000 of them, will 
say, what do you know? They were right. And they'll get saved. You still have to explain why they're sealed and not the Gentile Christians. I don't think so. God wouldn't play that. He would not make the Gentile Christians second-class Christians. Not after Paul says that we are the spiritual heirs of Abraham. This is a picture of heaven. And in heaven, there are only two kinds of Christians, living and dead. The living, the 12 times 12, the worldwide religion times worldwide religion times complete times complete times complete means all the Christians. I like being literal, and I know I'm not here. I'm a bit consoled by the fact that most scholarship agrees with this, that the 144,000 are the spiritual children of Abraham. They are the Christians. You know, nowhere else in the Bible are nowhere else in John, at least, are they separated. There's not a two-class system in the New Testament world where Jewish Christians were here and Gentile Christians were here. It does not exist. All Christians are the children of God and stand before God, who is no respecter of persons. So I don't believe it would start here for one time. No. We are brothers in the Lord. We are brethren in the Lord. We are not in a tiered caste system. This is the picture of heaven. The ones on earth need to know that they are sealed. You and I need to know we are sealed. That means the only advantage the devil has over us is when he convinces us to listen to one of his lies. That's it. If we would ignore the devil... Now, I will grant you that's hard. He is, Jesus calls him the prince of the power of the air. The environment in which we're surrounded belongs to Satan. What we see on television, the internet, the newspapers, what we see in rumors, what we see in patenting passed around or Facebook or Twitter or any electronic medium you want to name is under the power of Satan. We can listen and begin to grieve. We begin to say we're doomed. Evil is going to win. Who can defeat the evil one? Who can stand? We're going to grieve. And grief can lead to despair. And despair is a sin for a Christian. We should never be worried. We should never give up. Because God has sealed us and we are untouchable. Tell you what the devil can do to us. He can defeat us. We can be so grief stricken over the, our belief in his thoughts and his lies that we fail completely to live Christian lives. We're broken. Because we listen to the devil. We can't. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit. We are untouchable. I'm not smarter than the devil. I'm not more powerful than the devil. There is no way where I can defeat the devil. But it doesn't matter because Jesus defeated him and sealed me with the Holy Spirit. And he's done the same for you. We win because Jesus won. We don't need to do anything. We don't need to worry about how much power we have or how much wisdom we have or how much whatever we think we need. All we need is that Jesus is to realize that Jesus won the battle. When he said it's finished, it was finished. When he died on the cross, he won. It's over. And we're sealed with the Holy Spirit who cannot be overcome by the devil or by his demons. And for those who do die, notice to be spiritually sealed does not mean you're untouchable. 
Christians will say, why did God let these bad things happen to me? We grieve. I heard a preacher say um, this morning that every Monday morning he quits because he feels like such a failure. The victory was never about us. It's never about how good a preacher I am, how good a pastor I am, how well I can deal in theology. None of that matters. None of that is essential. Now, I am called to be faithful, and so it's my job to work. My duty before God, not my job at my church, but my duty before God to be faithful as a preacher, faithful as a pastor, faithful as a studier of God's word. But it's not up to me. It's up to God through Jesus Christ. And if I do die, I'll have victory before the throne of God. This is not then just a picture of the martyrs. It's a picture of everyone because every Christian goes through persecution. Everyone. This is a picture of what your loved ones are enjoying now. This is a picture of your future and mine. We will st at that throne we've been talking about, we talked about for two chapters. The great God of glory, the great loving God, we stand there. The 24 elders, the four living creatures, yes, and so do we. Get kind of crowded, but God's big. This is a promise of our salvation, a promise of our redemption, a promise of our rescue. What Jesus began on the cross, he will finish in heaven. You have God's promise. We're looking at the end of time, but it must begin with the realization we're going to be okay. Because ultimately, that's the most important message. You might care more about how history going to spell out. Who's the Antichrist? For example, there's some scholars who take the fact that Dan is not mentioned here, the tribe of Dan is not mentioned, to mean that the Antichrist will come out of the tribe of Dan. You're going to have a lot of supposition like that when it comes to Revelation. A lot of people who will put half-baked ideas together and create theories They're interesting. They sell books. I find it fascinating that those type of books, apocryphal books, apocalyptic literature, sold in the first century too. They don't, we don't read them today because they turned out to be trash. Every theory, I began Revelation by reminding you that Jesus says of the day an hour of the last of judgment day nobody knows not the angels in heaven not even Jesus on earth knew only the father who's in heaven knows we're not going to figure out from these words anything about the future the best we're going to get is two things most important, we're going to get reassurance that we're okay. We may suffer and die on, the cross, on our own cross, but we're going to be okay. We will arise in heaven. That is more important than any naming of Hitler as the Antichrist or whichever political leader you want to name today as the Antichrist. It's more important for us to realize that we are cared for. 
And secondly, we need to remember that we're only going to realize the full truth after the fact, after it's been revealed. We're not smarter than God. We're not going to figure him out ahead of time. He's not a magician pulling a trick, and we're going to see through it. It'll only be afterwards when he reveals it to us that we're going to understand. So take the Bible for what it's giving you, for what it intends to give, that God is on his throne, he is all-powerful, he is all-loving, and we're okay. The key point here is the sealing of God's Christians still on earth. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit. We are untouchable. I hope that's a blessing. We've still got a number of chapters to go. And we're going to get deeper and deeper into theories. And I will give you opposing theories as time permits to uh, help you better understand the different schools of thought because in the end you're going to have to make up your own mind just I, I'm convinced that I'm right that one lens we have to look through is the lens of who God is writing to and I believe he's writing to every Christian of every period it would have been cruel for John to write this letter and say I know things are terrible but cheer up in 2,000 years, 3,000 years, you're going to be all right. I don't think so. So it's not all about the future. But I also don't agree with those people who say this is all about the past and a dead book. If that were the case, it would not need to be in the Bible. God promises that his word does not return to him void. God doesn't waste words. His word goes out to every generation and comes back bearing fruit because that's the way God's word works. There is a blessing in here for first century Christians, 10th century Christians, Christians today. There's a message in here for you and me. Let's find it and let's praise God in the process because we win. That burden's been lifted. There's no doubt about that. The, the revelation promises we win. As always, in Christ's service and in yours, I am your pastor. Good night. <laughs>